I will bring the uh, Civil Law and Data Practices Committee to order. Happy St. Patrick's Day to everyone here. Pinch your neighbor if they do not have green on. Don't pinch me. <laughs> um, the first order of business would be to uh, approve the minutes of March 12th. Um, Representative Hillstrom, have you had the opportunity to look at the minutes for March 12th? Yes. Could you move those? Yes, Madam Chair, I move the minutes. Um, we've, uh, the minutes of March 12th have been moved. All those in favor of approving the minutes of March 12th, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, say nay. The minutes are approved. The First bill on the agenda today is House File 742. So if we could have Representative O'Neill come on down. And uh, if Mr. Gearing or if House staff could tell us which parts of House File 742 pertain to our committee, that would be helpful. Because we want to focus just on those areas. Uh, Madam Chair and members, uh, there are several sections in this uh, DE7 amendment that relate to data practices, so I'll just walk, them th walk through them fairly quickly. Uh, section 1 on page 1 uh, is a cross-reference to uh, uh, data related to allegations of sexual assault uh, in Chapter 13. Uh, in Section 4 on page 2 in paragraph 8, uh, there's language related to protecting the privacy of sexual assault victims, which includes um, uh, some data language. Uh, on page 3, paragraph 20, this again is in the section uh, requiring institutions to create their uh, new policy related to sexual assault. There's uh, data related to access to student records. Uh, on page 4, section 7 is an online reporting system that has some data classifications and data requirements. Uh, section 8 on page 5 also has some data collection and reporting uh, requirements uh, that runs through uh, line 6.29 on page 6. Uh, section 9 on page 6 is a uh, uh, access to data and audit trail section uh, that uh, requires some accountability and oversight of um, access to sexual assault incident data. Um, and then, uh, Madam Chair, on page uh, 9, lines 9.5, 9.6, there's an additional classification of data uh, related to data that is shared with a confidential resource. Thank you, Mr. Gearing. Uh, Representative O'Neill, I will move House File 742, and do you want to speak to your DE7 amendment. Thank you. Uh, the DE7, after meeting with the stakeholders, uh, we had some clarifying language that we wanted to change and just make sure that it was very clear in the bill. Um, the first change is in the victim rights section, and it further clarifies who can access the data. And so there was a concern as to making sure that only those that had specific job requirements would access that data, and so they changed the language to be very specific so that those who have work assignments that reasonably require access would only have access. It further clarifies that victims can have access to their own description of the event instead of the entire investigatory file, and that had to do with if we allow the victim to have the entire investigatory file, then the, um, the accused would also have access, and there was concern as to uh, what would have to be redacted. and so. To make that a little bit easier, um, it was clearly stated in the language that they could have access to their incident report that they created themselves. And the reason uh, that's in the victim rights section is because the victim has to tell her story over and over and over again. And so it was trying to resolve some of that so she wouldn't have to retell her story 10 times, 20 times, whatever it was. And so that was just uh, an ease in, in the trauma. There's a, some changes and clarifications under the data collection and reporting section. It further clarifies that the Office of Higher Education must report uh, both statewide data, and so they're going to aggregate all the information all the way up to the state level and then come back down and have information for each individual institution. And because of federal and state law, we also had to add an explanation there that they would explain on their website why they wouldn't be able to report in some institutions because of FERPA. In the comprehensive training section, we clarified who is required to complete the training of sexual assault. Uh, we were In the previous committee we were in, we had some questions regarding who uh, actually has to complete the training because there are so many folks that come in and off of college campuses. Um, they might come for a continuing education class. They might come for other things where that institution really doesn't have a relationship with that person. There's visitors that come and go. So just to clarify that really the people we want to take the training are those that are seeking a degree or a certification or the PSEO students 
And then just to make sure we didn't miss anything, we added a line that said that if the institution believes that there are other categories that need to be added, that they can go ahead and do that. But what we didn't want happening is the institutions being required to provide this training for folks that really don't have a relationship and the, that institution doesn't have jurisdiction over that person. We also made some changes to the completion of the training. We moved it off of the transcript, which was burdensome and difficult for the institutions, and instead allowed them to come up with their own reporting and proof of completion documentation that will travel with the student. And the final thing that we made a change for was um, that if a student is enrolled in one or more, excuse me, more than one class or institution of the same system, that they only have to take that requirement one time. We have folks within the Minsky system that might be taking classes two, three, four different institutions, whether it be online or physically at the campus. And so um, to relieve that burden off of those particular students, we address that issue with that change. And those are the changes in the current DE7. Thank you, Representative O'Neill. Uh, um, we have a birthday. Yeah, I, I think that uh, Representative Bob Vogel, the birthday boy today, um, <laughs> would you like to move the DE7? I'd be pleased to. Oh, thank you. So the DE7 is before us. Any further discussion on the DE7? Seeing none, all those in, all those in favor of approving the DE7, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. The DE7 is, is, uh, is on the bill, or replaces it, I guess. Representative O'Neill, um, any further comments that you'd like to make, or would you like your testifier to um, speak? Thank you, Madam Chair. I think at this point, I'll turn it over to the testifier, since Mr. Uh, Gehring had actually gone through quite a bit of the specific, what's specific in this bill that you'll be pertaining to. Thank you. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the tape. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Caroline Palmer, and I'm the Law and Policy Manager at the Minnesota Coalition Against Sexual Assault. And I'm actually joined here today by Yvonne Knoyer, who is our Prevention Manager, and she can also help answer any questions. MNCASA is a statewide coalition. We represent 60 sexual assault victim services programs, and many of those programs do work with colleges and universities. I really want to say how pleased we are that there is interest in dealing with the issue of campus sexual assault. We know that it's a problem that should be addressed. I actually looked recently at some uh, campus survey results for my own alma mater, Barnard College, and learned that 20% of the students there said they had been um, subjected to some sort of unwanted sexual conduct. And so we know this is an issue that comes up in all campuses. We really very much appreciate Representative O'Neill's commitment to this issue. She's been a wonderful partner for us to work with. Um, she's worked closely with us and other stakeholders in order to make sure the bill gets into the shape that you see it today. And I really want to emphasize this has not been an easy bill to pull together. There's a really complex interplay of federal and state law and also all the campus policies that also come into play. And so it's been a real balancing act, but I think this bill has achieved um, quite a bit and we're happy to support all the work that's come into it so far. I would like to direct your attention to some guiding principles that Mincasa has put together on responding to campus sexual assault and I do believe this bill has met those principles. It is really about um, victim autonomy, access to advocacy, confidentiality protections, data practices protections, consistent practices and compatibility with federal law. And then also we want to make sure that there is meaningful training offered. And again, we believe the bill has met all of these requirements. I would like to just offer one um, small change, and, and Representative O'Neill is familiar with our consideration in this area um, before I close. Um, on line 3.29, you will see the word forcible. And we would like to have that word struck. And, and really the, the reason is, is we don't disagree that the Code of Federal Regulations does use that terminology, but um, that is a term that we're trying to get away from in talking about sexual assault. It's a one form of sexual assault, but we certainly know that there are many different ways that sexual assault can manifest itself through coercive activity or if a victim is incapacitated and force isn't needed. Um, the CFR definition, when you look at it more closely, actually does define acts that don't require force. And so really what we're looking to do is to just um, take that word out of the bill um, because we know here in our state we do see a broader um, 
way of defining sexual assault. We're not asking to use the sexual assault definitions, though, from our criminal sexual conduct code, because that's too confusing. <laughs> we want to make sure we stick with the CFR definition. But we would just like to have the, the word removed for uh, forcible removed, because we do feel it's sort of an old term. And in many ways, our state law is ahead of the federal government in this sense. Um, again, I'd like to thank you for your attention and uh, really thank, again, Representative O'Neill for all of her hard work on this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Um, our next testifier is uh, Joelle Stangler. Representative Lesh. Oh, uh, Representative Hilstrom, I was hoping to take um, all the testimony and then have member questions. Is that all right with uh, you? That's, that's fine, Madam Chair. I just wanted to talk specifically about that definition, and she just okay. testified about it, so all whatever right. you'd like. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. So. Um, the, it's on line uh, 4.5, the definition that you were just speaking of of sexual assault with forcible. I just really want to know for the implications of this bill, if one of the uh, acts occur that Minnesota law um, classifies as a sexual assault, um, but it isn't defined under federal regulation um, under this definition, what happens? What's the school's responsibility? I know they don't have to report it in the same fashion, but what about the wraparound services and the counseling and the other pieces of this bill? Do they still have to provide the services even if it doesn't meet this definition on 4.5? Ms. Palmer. Madam Chair, Representative Hillstrom, um, I'll, I'll take a stab at the answer and, and make sure this is correct, but I believe the school would still have a requirement to respond. It is something that is happened on campus. Uh, many campuses may also have more expansive definitions of sexual assault too that could go even broader. So um, we really want to encourage campuses to create broad policies. Now, they may be limited in what they have to report under the federal government, but they can go as broad as they want on the campus, and we certainly hope that they will. Representative Hillstrom. Thank you. All right, thank you, um, uh, Ms. Car or Ms. Palmer. Uh, Joelle Stangler. Is Joelle here? <laughs> yeah, she's not here today. Oh, OK, very good. We'll go to Courtney Blake. I'm sorry, I don't, I don't see them here today. They, okay. They're U of M students and they, uh, All right. they're on break, they so probably, they must They probably had a test this morning or something. Um, uh, member questions for um, either the previous testifier or Representative O'Neill. Uh, Representative uh, Pinto. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I guess I, I want to ask Representative O'Neill what she thinks about the, the point about forcible, because I, I do have that concern as well. I'm a, a prosecutor of... Um, domestic and sexual violence, and um, and of course there are so many offenses that don't involve force, so to speak, but but would be captured by this. So it does seem like including that word forcible is misleading in the statute. So would you um, accept a, a friendly amendment to take that word out? What what are your what are your thoughts on that? Thank you, Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair and Representative Pinto. So the reason that that word is in there is because if you look clearly at the Clery Act, which is the federal act that the schools have to follow. That we wanted to make absolutely sure that we were following their definition so that they didn't have to report two different definitions of what an incident is. And if you look at the Clary report, or excuse me, the Clary definition, there's forcible and non forcible. And under the non forcible is things like incest and statutory rape, which don't fit. Everything else that's uh, within our sexual conduct code through five is there with the exception of some stalking language and some other things that are reported outside of this bill but is reported uh, so violence and stalking and things like that is reported elsewhere um, by the schools and so the only reason that it's there is to clearly say that we're talking about this portion of the federal law and um, if you have further questions I know that Matt could probably Matt Kieran could probably explain that um, if I've missed anything. So that's um, the only reason that it's there, I guess, is because if you say, if you take the word out, now you've included non-forcible in the definition of Clary, and so that would include statutory rape and incest, which is probably not pertinent to uh, a college campus. Representative Hillstrom. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, but statutory rape, given that you have PSEO students that are underage, certainly could apply. Um, it, it could, um, we could definitely look at that again. It just, when we were doing the side-by-side -side comparison and thinking about the population, um, it, that gets into, as you know, some other issues as well, but. Representative Hilston, follow-up? No. Representative Lesh. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and thanks for bringing this bill 
Representative O'Neill. As far as that question, the forcible uh, language, I feel like it warrants a much broader discussion. Um, and uh, I appreciate Minkasa's <clears throat> intent that it's a word that they're trying to get away from. Uh, but I know for my purposes, I, it, it gets really comp. This, this goes right to the heart of a lot of things that we end up debating um, a lot of times in, in public safety committee. Um, so if we're going to modify something like that, I feel like I want to hear a lot more testifiers uh, from different perspectives on this before I'm ready to make a decision. So I'd, I'd prefer not to change it right now, at least until we've had that discussion. Thank you, Representative Lesh. I, I would concur that's, that that word is a pretty powerful word in the, in the context of this bill. And I think if that has to be a global agreement among all the stake, stakeholders whether or not to, to remove that word or not. Further question, uh, Representative O'Neill. Madam Chair, to that point, I do have the institutions that are here. So we have uh, the U of M, Minsku, the private colleges, and I think OHE is here as well, the Office of Higher Ed. I, I don't know if they would like to weigh in on specifically, because what we're trying to do is report the right information. And I would love to not have that word there, but that word has meaning um, according to the Clery Act. And so we're trying really hard to align their reporting so they don't have confusing reporting and we have valuable data. If Someone sure from, like. call out whoever you would like, Representative O'Neill. <laughs> okay, I think we have a willing participant okay. here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for coming forward. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and go ahead with your, your testimony. Good morning. My name is Toya Younger, and I'm the Associate Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs with Minnesota State Colleges and Universities. Uh, Madam Chair, Representative, um, I uh, completely agree. I think the word forcible has uh, a lot of connotations, particularly in the context of this bill. And so um, we would probably have some issues with removing that with, with that term as well, um, particularly, as she said, uh, while our concern has been the reporting um, and having to report in addition to what we already provide to Cleary. Um, I do think that forcible uh, really gets to the heart of what Representative O'Neill is trying to um, address and basically what we have seen on a national level in terms of sexual violence on campus. Thank you. Any questions for this testifier? Thank you very much. Seeing no further questions from committee members, Representative O'Neill, I will renew my motion. Um, to re-refer House File 742 as amended to the Higher Ed Committee. Uh, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. You're on your way back to Higher Ed. Thank you, Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair and Committee. The next bill we are going to be hearing is 582, House File 582. Representative Anderson, is he in the room? Just, yeah, I just saw, yeah, there he is. Welcome back to the committee, Representative Anderson. Good morning, Madam Chair and members. I will move House File 582 um, and ask that it be re-referred to the Committee on Environment and Natural Resources. Um, Representative Anderson, uh, are there any amendments to your bill this morning? Yeah, Madam Chair, yes, there are. There were two amendments up on the, uh, the dais back there, and uh, we're going to be going with the DE3 amendment. That's the later amendment, so I would like to, if you would move uh, for us, please, the DE3 amendment. All right, the birthday boy, uh, Representative Vogel, will move the DE3, and the DE2 then is a, is a we're just discarding that then? Yeah, it, it was Anderson. just a couple of uh, technical changes from the DE2 to the 3, so the 3 is the most current one. Here. All right, very good. So the DE3 is before us. Uh, to, to the DE3, Representative Anderson. Well, thank you again, Madam Chair. This bill has been brought to us, uh, as we see a need here, to uh, offer some level of, of uh, stability and protection to uh, some of our uh, larger feedlots in the state. We already have these protections for small operations in Minnesota, and what this does is extend those protections to, to some of our larger feedlots if they follow all the rules currently in place, all the state standards, there would be a, uh, an assurance here that the, they would not be subject to a, a possible nuisance lawsuit. 
And Madam Chair, I have a, a testifier who would like to go through some of the changes we've made. This bill was heard in the, in the Ag Policy Committee and a number of concerns were raised, uh, good concerns, and we have tried to address those in this new amendment and we'd like to walk you through those if we could, Madam Chair. Sure. Welcome to the committee and please state your name for the record. Madam Chair, Jack Perry from the Briggs & Morgan Law Firm. And if I may begin, the, the, there's two real major changes that, that uh, were requested by various, various uh, members of Representative Anderson's committee. The, the first one, the most major one, was the initial version of this applied to both pending and future claims, nuisance claims. And various people raised concerns about, about due process, et cetera, and so the pending was scrapped and this only applies prospectively, which is the normal course. The second change was was one that that um, I should have picked up on earlier because it was just it was just poorly drafted and and I had played a part in that so I apologize for that is the initial draft of this had um, the step back there, there's two bills that are very very similar and and, and essentially should be cross referenced that's one sixteen oh seven one three the livestock odor bill and then five sixty one point one nine subdivision two they relate to one another and and so they need to, to in fairness to everyone to know what they're doing they need to be shown together and the change is shown together um, but the, the the besides that the error that that I made in the draft and helping draft the first part was was that we put the changes to subdivision two right into subdivision two rather than what they really belong is to a separate subdivision which is now subdivision 2b so if you look at version three under sub Division 2B, the additional language is to, to, to put a new heading on there and then just to move what was previously in sub Subdivision 2 into Subdivision 2B. But the heading tells you the difference and why it was done. Um, 2A is, is an exemption from nuisance claims. 2B is not an exemption from nuisance cases. All it is is based on, on the legislature's prior laws, there is a minimum threshold standard that needs to be satisfied in order to bring nuisance cases in the state of Minnesota. And this just clarifies that that's what has to happen. For example, in 1967, the legislature passed a law that said, you, said that the PCA, which I think, uh, yeah, they're in the audience here, uh, they were to, pass noise standards, statewide noise standards. They were supposed to pass statewide uh, air emission standards, which they did in 1986 and 82, respectively. And in that law in 1967, the legislature said that, that you can't have local standards which are more stringent. Those are, the, those are the maximum standards for noise and air emissions. And the natural correlation of that is then it's, okay, if you're gonna bring a nuisance case, because those are standards that are built for, are set by this PCA for, for nuisance and environmental protection, then you need to, to bring a nuisance case, you need to at least have a, a, a non-compliance with that, those standards. And so the heading on 2B now reads, adverse impact required compliance with state standards. So in other words, if a facility is in compliance with all the noise standards and air emission standards and livestock odor standards, they cannot be sued for nuisance. So it's not an exemption, it is simply a a threshold showing that a nuisance complainant or plaintiff must sh must show. Those are the two uh, major changes, Chair Scott. Th thank you, Mr. Perry. Um, further um, discussion on the DE3 amendment. Seeing none, uh, Representative Vogel uh, renews his motion uh, to move the DE3 amendment. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. The DE3 is now the language in front of us. Um, we do have some more, uh, quite a list of testifiers, and so if, if the testifiers could limit their um, testimony to about two minutes each, that would be great. The first person I have on, um, on the list is Fran Breider, Breeder, and Molly Campbell is on deck, if, if, if Molly could be ready to go. Good morning, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my name is Fran Breider. Um, I am uh, um, 
a production manager with uh, Protein Sources, a, a management company out of uh, based out of Mapleton, Minnesota. Um, I currently am um, managing a facility up in Todd County, and uh, um, I was a city kid that grew up in in, uh, in a small town. Never got really into agriculture, and and through a family member was introduced to animal agriculture, and. Um, I've really enjoyed uh, the work that we do. Um, I've, I'm currently moved up to, to Osakis, Minnesota to manage this facility and have really uh, um, was very excited about the opportunity to, it's a new state of the art facility um, with the newest technologies. And um, um, I had the opportunity to train local, um, local residents to, to manage this facility um, in the long term. And uh, what it's really done is it's created an environment where, where we've got local folks that are able to, instead of uh, moving off and, and, finding, and finding jobs in other areas, they stay local um, and, and stay in the communities they grew up in and make these small communities thrive. Um, this facility is, is, like I said, one of a kind. And uh, we've done, um, the management company I work for, we have over 250 years of knowledge of experience that went into the thought processes of how this facility was built with um, and obviously following all the the local the the state and the government regulations was, was the main key and uh, they've done a very fine job of that and it's uh, one of a kind um, so any any questions you would have for me I would, I would be happy to entertain them Thank you. Uh, Mr. Brighter, did I say that yes, right? Yes, Brighter. Brighter. Yep. Um, we're going to hear from all the testifiers, then stand sure. by if there are any questions. Um, okay. We will certainly address those to you. Will Thank do. you so much for your testimony. Thank you. uh, Ms. Campbell and Delvin Durheim is from Todd County Livestock Board is next. Hi, welcome to the committee. Go ahead and state your name for the record. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair. My name is Molly Campbell. I am a current employee at the Gorley Family Farms in Long Prairie, Minnesota. I work there as the farrowing manager, and I very much so enjoy my job because I get to take care of the sows that are giving birth as well as the newly born piglets and the piglets that are up to wean age, which is roughly 21 days. And I find this job very enjoyable. And, and sadly, in our area, opportunities that arise are very limited, where you enjoy your job, you have the wages that you need, the benefits that you need, and also the hours that you need. And before I was employed with the Gorleys, I was working two different jobs with none of these benefits. And I was barely making men's eat, ends meet between uh, bills, house payments, mortgage payments, such as this. And the Gorleys really gave me that opportunity to spend more time with my family, working better hours, spend more time enjoying life. And it, they've really taken a lot of stress off me and my family. And I just really want to uh, show my appreciation and thanks to them for giving me or opening up these opportunities not only to me but also to my community and making me uh, stay more local instead of having to drive down to St. Cloud which is in Stearns County I can stay in Todd County and and really support my community in in a financial way and uh, just being there for everyone that I need to be with great I know that can be a dangerous job those those sows aren't always the friendliest when they're, when they're with their pigs. Um, any, uh, I guess, thank you for your testimony, and we'll move on to uh, Mr. Durheim. I hope I have that, na that name right. And then Paul Fitzsimmons is the next uh, testifier. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and continue my name your testimony. Is, <coughs> excuse me. My name is Delvin Durheim, and I also am from Todd County. Uh, one of my responsibilities there, I'm involved in some local government issues, and one of my uh, appointments is, is I was appointed to the Todd County Livestock Advisory Council, which is uh, there are persons in, 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 <coughs> excuse me, appointed by each of the commissioner districts. Um, our area is very rural. Our population is only approximately 25,000 people, and agriculture has been the number one industry there for many, many years specifically livestock production. Our area is not really conducive to strong crop production, so how most of the people in our area for ag production have made use of their crops is through the livestock industry. That is where they've garnered their, their basis of their income. 
certainly this was a, a welcome opportunity to our area to have a facility such as is the Gorleys come in there because it did offer a huge economic benefit to our area, um, not only in employment, uh, but for some of the uh, other issues that were brought in, such as local construction and those types of things as well. Um, <clears throat> the now with the new facilities that we now use has certainly changed the uh, the outcome and the way things are done as business as usual. Um, we were a strong dairy operation prior. Prior to this, uh, dairy industry has dwindled somewhat, and we've now gone to larger facilities, um, which have become more efficient. But one of the reasons that they have become larger is because of our aging population. There is not a lot of people coming forth to take the place of the people that are retiring. So what is happening is facilities are becoming larger. They've become um, one person is buying out two or three older people that no longer are able to uh, continue on in that business. So consequently, facilities get larger. But because of that, they also become much more efficient, um, and especially with the use of technology. Uh, again, if uh, I just cannot emphasize enough how much the economic benefit has been uh, for hiring of local people uh, to come in and, and work in this, these facilities. Um, it certainly has offered some huge opportunities for some people uh, that were not gainfully employed in the past. Um, it is with also with our advisory council, we work very strongly with our local enforcement people. Um, one of the people that is a member of our livestock advisory is our local uh, feedlot officer. So we uh, keep in close contact with that person as well. So we try to uh, watch all the th situations that are coming, positive or negative, uh, and try to certainly encourage the uh, positive outcomes, which I think is what we are headed for in our area very strongly. Thank you very much for your testimony. You are welcome. Please stand by if there are any questions <coughs> later. Thank you. Mr. Fitzsimmons uh, is, is uh, at the table, and David Preisler, Preisler uh, Minnesota Pork Producers, is on deck. Welcome uh, to the committee. Please state your name for the record. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. My name is Paul Fitzsimmons from Mapleton, Minnesota. <clears throat> and I want to say top of the morning, I'm a little hoarse today, but I truly am Irish. <laughs> and uh, I come from a 20-generation family farm because my father, who was Irish, would think that time spent in Ireland would count also. <laughs> so that's why I'm going to say 20th. So we got, I got a family farm. I'm one of nine siblings. All nine of us work together at, at our at our management company and, and uh, we own sow facilities ourselves. We also manage for other farmers. And of those other farmers and everything gets lumped into what's large, what's not. Um, so we manage 35,000 sows in and around southern Minnesota, Iowa. Of those 35,000 sows, there are 82 family owners that are in there. As they get spread out, these, they go back to the families to finish them through market. So and I, I brought Fran and Molly along and uh, they, are, they represent the people that work in these facilities. We, we have about 280 employees, and I think Molly and Fran represent the fabric of what these facilities bring into rural America, in rural Minnesota, southern Minnesota. So if we were to go across southern Minnesota, there's, there's as many sows in ownership in southern Minnesota than there is probably anywhere else in the U.S. And so it is the fabric as these people are woven into the small towns and communities across southern Minnesota. As an industry, I know we understand the role we play in the environment and the resources. And we are committed to do the best. And I think in, back in 97, when this law was passed, with bipartisan support, um, I, it was intended to help farmers get some certainty in their operations. One thing we can't live with is the uncertainty of going through two years of township, county, pollution, Minnesota Pollution Control doing an EAW, and then coming back and putting those operations, spending millions of dollars in operations, getting animals, livestock in, getting the people in place, and then, and then having lawsuits that are brought, even though we meet every standard that we were judged by coming in. So the uncertainty of this is leaving us in a, in a place where 
I have three or four projects that are on the board. I don't think going forward that I could go on with those projects in Minnesota if, if we don't have some certainty that somebody down the road is not going to come back at us, even though we follow all the standards in which we were judged by to begin with. So, um, and I, we, we, we face a new problem in the industry. And the, end of, the industry is being faced with outside forces that are coming into Minnesota. And somebody said, you know, is the wolf at the door? No, the wolf is in the room. And that, that wolf is looking for ways to hinder the Minnesota livestock operations, and it doesn't matter what size. The size limit is in there, that will disappear also. So we're, we need to have that certainty and uh, I think Minnesota producers across the board have worked since 97 to put money in. We've self-funded research along with the University of Minnesota. The Pollution Control have worked closely with them and, and the DNR to make sure that these facilities are all not only compliant but are way under the standards. And that's all, that's all come through a lot of producer on every species hard work over the last 10, 15 years. Thank, thank you, you, Mr. Fitzsimmons. Please, thank you for your testimony. Please stand by for questions. Uh, David Preisler, or Priestler, and then Braun Scherer is on, on deck. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record, and um, if, you could, if you could, please try to limit your testimony to um, two minutes. Will do. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee, for the record, my name is David Preisler. I'm the Executive Director of the Minnesota Pork Producers Association. And on behalf of Minnesota farmers who raise pigs for a living, um, we uh, ask for your support um, for the amended um, House File 582. Um, like was stated before, we're committed um, to compliance with state standards and really what this bill is, is really uh, uh, rewards that compliance. Um, this bill doesn't change state standards or, or enforcement environmental rules. Um, it again, just provides some certainty. Um, briefly, really what's at stake is that if we look at Minnesota agriculture, it's it brings $21 billion to Minnesota's economy each year. 40% of that $21 billion comes from livestock. And so um, if we have threats that are in place, um, especially from, uh, from lawsuits that are, that are really unfounded but unfortunately very expensive, um, it, it really creates um, a risk for that 40% that of that $21 billion worth of, of income that it provides for Minnesota farmers and, and actually for the state. I'll finish up by... Um, uh, making sure that you know that it's, it's not just the pork producers that support this. Um, we also have gotten the support from the Minnesota cattlemen's, Minnesota milk producers, um, turkey growers, chicken and eggs, corn growers, soybean growers, uh, Farm Bureau, um, wheat and barley. And so there's a, there's a broad coalition that's actually in favor of this. Um, it is not just something related to, to hog farms. This is related to all farms. And the reason it's important to crop farms is that um, really the livestock farms are the market uh, for these crops and without livestock farms it really puts crop farms at risk. So with that, thank you for your time and uh, again we'd appreciate your support on this bill. Thank you Mr. Preisler for your, for your testimony. Uh, next is Braun Sharon on deck, Amy Goodwin. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record. Good morning, Madam Chair. My name is Bron Shear. I'm a CPA and partner with Mr. Fitzsimmons and Protein Sources. We founded the company in the mid-90s. I live in Northfield, uh, Minnesota, and uh, worked in the, as a public accountant at Arthur Anderson in the 80s, and have been on my own consulting and also I'm a pork producer, own real estate in pork, and uh, advise independent farmers in uh, Minnesota and other parts of the country. Um, I just I, I echo Mr. Fitzsimmons' testimony, and we've lived it. There is a litigation on, ongoing with respect to the Gorley site, and I think for your purposes and being barraged with the information and the amount that you have to sift through, I would encourage you to look at that lawsuit and also to look at the MPCA website and look at the Gorley Brothers EAW, the Environmental Assessment Worksheet that was prepared with uh, significant resources and again is I think is a necessary and part of starting a uh, and developing a feedlot. You'll hear testimony I think that gives the impression that God knows what the picture is that you'll think of when you think of what this feedlot looks like. I, I, I would encourage you and again you're busy uh, I would encourage anyone to go up and look at that site stand at the property line and uh, tell me that it appears uh, is not a professional 
and a state-of-the-art modern facility that also w went through modeling, including older modeling that we paid for with the MPCA to, uh, to address the needs of the neighbors. We have, I grew up in Martin County, uh, one of the one or two or three, I don't know where it ranks now, uh, most pig dense counties in the United States. Grew up on a family farm, I live on Northfield, but I'm on the edge of a significant turkey barn facility, so I know all about a animal agriculture. But the Gorleys are, are painted as an out-of-staters, corporate farmers. Again, these are multi-generational, independent family farmers that could make a, frankly, could make a living a lot easier ways. I could too, but we love animal livestock. We've been in it for generations. It provides those jobs that were talked about by Molly and Fran. But none of that's important if we damage the environment, and that's not the case. We, we have, there's no better environmental stewards as a group than, swi than livestock producers and swine producers in this state in, in particular. We're leaders in the world, and that facility in Todd County, which, you know, again, we focus on here, but, but it, it's a broader issue, but this is a classic case where we're gonna spend hundreds of thousands of dollars defending this frivolous lawsuit, and the nuisance is on our side, and, uh, and for what? What are our recourse when we win? We've spent, and that's what, there are outside groups, as Mr. Fitzsimmons reported, that have never been on a farm. They're from the East Coast. We're fighting dozens of attorneys whose goal is not, they don't care about the neighbors. They don't care about animals. They don't care about our industry. They don't care about our employees. They care about eliminating animal livestock in the United States of America. And, and, that, and that's not just the Humane Society. There are others as well. So with that, I'm proud to be a part of this industry. It's key to the vitality of rural Minnesota and, and the economic activity and the ability, frankly, for both parties to spend money. Here at the least, we pay a lot of taxes, we pay a lot of fees. Without animal agriculture in this state, I shudder to think what rural Minnesota would be like. And once it's gone, it does not come back. I really appreciate your time this morning. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for that testimony. Ms. Oh, Mr. Perry, were you wanting to testify again? I did. I I'm sorry. No, I, that's okay. I crossed you out because I thought well, we've heard from you. Go ahead. I thought maybe you were giving me a hint. Uh, no, go ahead. If you could keep your testimony to two minutes, that would I be can do it awesome. Shorter than that, I think. If I can approach, I give it to. Uh, we have a page here that I think could handle handle that for you. <clears throat> Madam Chair, I have two handouts. So you want to that, introduce yourself again? Oh, I, I'm sorry, Madam Chair. Right. It's Jack Perry from the Briggs and Morgan Law Firm. And I have two handouts. I'm not going to go through them, but for those like me who like to know a little more about what you're doing, a little more background, I know there's some lawyers in this committee. The first one is a four-point explanation as to, <coughs> to how we got to this point. And the second one is a chart that goes through uh, from, from uh, Representative Anderson's committee. There were nine different concerns that, that we were able to, to Pieced together that were that were presented, and the some of those concerns we were already addressed with the changes. The other concerns um, are addressed not by m my attempt to persuade, but by actual legislation and Minnesota rules. So the stuff on this chart left is the concerns that were raised in front of his committee, and the right is is statutory uh, comments and rules that, that specifically address those concerns. What this boils down to, really simple, is, is the opponents of these facilities want to apply a subjective test. If a subjective test applies, that means a jury is going to be asked, does it smell too much? No other parameters. No, no standards are applicable. In 1997 and 2000, I have read the entire legislative history of what, what bipartisan group put together, and you created standards to address livestock odor. And you said, there are, th there are hundreds of different components that make up livestock odor, but we are going to pick out hydrogen sulfide and say, this is the proxy because that's the closest approximation we have. And that's what took place in 1997-2000. And all we're asking for is, is that that objective standard is applied for nuisance cases, or where there's noise, this is the noise standard, but the standards that are created by the Pollution Control Agency apply to the, these facilities. And the reason we need that is not just these lawsuits, but how do you invest, how do you get people to invest if they don't know what the rules of the game are? And if, if people complain, say the standards aren't high enough, 
Go to the PCA and change the standards. We don't, we can't profess to what the standards should be. All we're doing is we are a businesses that want to, to operate in this state under a, a set of guidelines that we can comply with. And, and that's it, objective versus subjective. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Perry, for your testimony. Um, Ms. Goodwin is next, and then um, Doug Eir Ayers. I probably botched that, but you're on deck, Ayers. Ms. Goodwin, welcome to the committee. Please uh, state your name for the record and go on with your testimony. Thank you. My name is Amy Goodwin. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I, I also have a frog in my throat this morning, allergies, and our wonderful early spring. <laughs> uh, Madam Chair and committee, thank you very much for hearing my testimony today. Um, I'm not here representing um, a, a big facility uh, or a business. I'm here uh, representing the people. I lived next to um, the facility that Fran Brider spoke of in Todd County. Uh, my family has lived in that place for almost 20 years. My husband and I uh, moved there after we were married and we built our home there. We had all of our children there and carved out you know, our home and our life there and intended on retiring there. And uh, my children you know, already joked about you know, who got it when mom and dad left. You know, that was our plan. <laughs> we have four sons. Um, when we first heard about this facility coming to Todd County, we were not against this facility in any way. Um, we were very involved in agriculture. My husband grew up on a large dairy farm. We have two neighbors that are hog farmers within a mile of our home, and agriculture is a part of what we love about where we live, and it's a part of our lives. Um, <clears throat> so we were not against this in any way. Um, it wasn't until I started hearing the concerns of some of the other neighbors that I became a little bit concerned. I'm a writer, I'm an author, and I do a lot of research in my career, and so I started doing my own research. And the things that I came across, uh, I came across several things that were a little disturbing, but the thing that concerned me the most um, was the effects that these facilities can have on people with respiratory issues. Uh, that concerned me because I have two children with asthma, and I have asthma myself. So this facility was, um, built in an area in Todd County where there are six homes within a half a mile of this facility. And this is a large facility. It's one of a kind, just as you've heard. Um, <clears throat> and that's awful close to six, red, six homes. Um, my home was a little over 2,000 feet away from this facility. And I was the fourth farthest away. So that gives you a picture of, of how many neighbors were closer than I was. So we gathered. and went to our local government, we went through all the correct steps, we went to the Livestock Committee, we went to our commissioners, we went to planning and zoning, we did everything we could to try to <clears throat> legally, from what we could do, to just try to say, hey, this isn't a great site, we're not against this, you know, coming to Todd County, we're not against the jobs that it's going to bring, we're not against what you're doing, but this is too close to our children, and it's going to make them sick, and we're afraid it's going to make them sick. Um, we were met with closed doors. It was very quickly turned into a battle of, oh, you're against agriculture, uh, which it is not, which we are not. So um, eventually, we did go to the MPCA. We did go to everywhere we needed to go. And doors opened for these facility owners. And eventually, the CUP went through. And we were pretty devastated. Uh, we didn't want to leave our home. We knew that that was going to be um, probably a possibility. And that's why we fought so hard to keep them out. We loved our home. We didn't want to leave our home. And so we decided that we would just wait and see what happened. So uh, the facility was built, and the hogs were brought in probably, I think the, the facility was finished in June, and hogs, I think, were brought in in July or August. Um, and very quickly, uh, we started to notice signs in our younger son, whose, whose asthma is a little more severe than our older son's. Um, he started needing his inhaler regularly, which wasn't the case before. Um, and it was really a very short time, a matter of months, until he was completely dependent on steroid nebulizers to keep him breathing freely. Uh, the, the attack came for him uh, eventually, uh, sometime I think in December, that uh, he had such an attack that all the medicine we had given him uh, wasn't working. Uh, his lips turned blue. And um, I can't tell you what that does to a parent if you've not experienced it, and I hope you haven't. It's a horrible thing to experience, to see the panic in your child's eyes when he cannot breathe. 
And that was the night that uh, my husband and I uh, quit fighting to stay in our home because home was not a safe place for our son. <clears throat> we put our house up for sale. We risked financial ruin and bought another home to get our son away from there. Uh, within a very short time, all of my children um, who had developed hacky coughs, um, their coughs cleared once we got them away from there. Um, and it was a, a horrible stress on our family. Um, it has been incredibly stressful on my children to leave their home. And we've all had our breakdowns about it. And my 13-year-old has sobbed over his home. And when he says, why did this happen to us? I don't have a good answer for that. I don't know why this happened to us. <clears throat> I'm sure that in Minnesota, in fact, I know, because I've talked with them, that there are hog facility owners and big facility farmers that are honest in their dealings. And they do everything that they can to work with their community around them. But that was not the case for us. And uh, that's how we ended up in this situation. <clears throat> the truth is that my family isn't the only family that's been affected. All of the neighbors that are the closest have been affected. And there are our neighbors and there are people in Todd County clearly who do not care about this situation because they are not affected by it. But we are. And we went through all the correct channels to get help, and no one would help us. And that's how we got where we are. I'm, I'm asking you today to please stop this bill. Our situation is a perfect example of what can happen when the power is taken away from the people. And that is what this bill will do. It will take away the power for us to defend ourselves. These facilities, there are states that require these facilities as law to be at least a mile away from all residents, a mile. Six homes within a half a mile. What this situation really needs is a hero. <laughs> and we need somebody to be strong enough and courageous enough to stand up and say, we will not let you treat Minnesotans in this way. That there are standards that need to be upheld. I don't know how you feel about this situation. I don't know what way you're leaning, but I hope that today you will stand with us. And in so doing, you will be standing with Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, Mr. Ayers, and on deck, Patrick Hines. I have handouts as well. OK. Should I? You can give those to the, he'll, the page will be right with you. Thank you. Welcome to the committee, Mr. Ayers. Did I get that right? You did. All right. Thank go ahead with your introduce yourself and go ahead with your testimony. If you could keep it brief, that would be great. Yes, uh, Madam Chair and distinguished members of the House Civil Law and Data Practices Committee, um, I did strike some lines from my uh, testimony today to brief it up a little bit in the interest of uh, time here. My name is Douglas Ayers, and I represent uh, Dodge County Concerned Citizens. We're a Southern Minnesota nonprofit citizens group concerned about rural issues. We are not against agriculture and we're not against animal agriculture since most of our group lives in rural Dodge County. But we do not believe HF 582 is a good bill for Minnesota. <coughs> Dodge County in southern Minnesota is a heavy animal agriculture county. It has a population of just over 20,000 people <coughs> and we have 85,000 animal units quickly approaching 100,000 animal units the majority of which are swine held in large swine barns. We also have turkey barns and we have a few dairy feedlots. With 85,000 animal units in our county already, our county produces the animal manure equivalent of 800,000 people. Uh, 85,000 animal units produces like 800,000 people, that much manure. And we only have 20,000 human residents in our county. My in-laws, Lowell and Evelyn Traum of Blooming Prairie operate a grain farm growing primarily corn and soybeans in Dodge County. Despite strong local opposition, our county recently approved a new 2,400 head swine barn one half mile from my in-law's farm. This was the 11th permitting of swine barns within a three mile radius of their, fa of their farmhouse. And it's now surrounded in every direction by swine barns. The annual manure produced by one facility, 2,400 a feeder pigs is equivalent to a town of 7,000 people moving in next door to your farmhouse. That's how much manure gets produced. Over 1 million gallons of liquid manure 
is produced in this one facility annually and it will be spread on nearby topsoil, often near creeks and streams. We have five major watersheds that run out of our county. Two flow directly toward the city of Rochester. Two flow into Goodyear County. And one flows directly through the city of Austin. We worry about manure runoff into these watersheds with so much animal manure now being produced in our county. The manure pits and manure spreading creates a significant odor nuisance to the neighbors who have to live near these facilities. Amy testified to this, what it's like. Despite very strong local opposition uh, to another swine project near my farm uh, several years ago, the county approved that operation too. You see in Dodge County on these issues, the county board is controlled by large feedlot interests. The county has never denied a new feedlot permit in our county to anyone. Uh, the county initially permitted one swine barn on this, far, on this site, then uh, they later allowed a second swine barn and then a third went in. Once the th three swine barns were up, the farm owner and his wife who lived on the property moved away to a new house three miles away. The neighbors couldn't move, <laughs> but the owner moved away. <laughs> it's not easy for neighbors to bring a nuisance claim in district court against a large feedlot operator as it usually is only filed as a last resort. Nuisance claims typically do not garner significant financial windfalls to the plaintiffs. A favorable outcome only results in a court ordering the feedlot operator to abate the nuisance. For example, the court will require the owner to install biofilters on their buildings to mi mi mitigate odor issue. If the legislature approves HF582, you would deny families like my father-in-law and other neighbors the opportunity to file a nuisance claim against a large feedlot operator you will limit their day in court. Several members of this committee are attorneys, and this bill removes a right to litigate. You're taking away a right to litigate against a large feedlot. These are rural citizen neighbors who have already been marginalized on the front end due to the steamrolling of large new feedlot permits being approved by the county. HF 582 would largely silence them on the back end and limit their ability to ever challenge a feedlot operator with a nuisance claim in district court. I believe this bill protects powerful feedlot interests in our state and is unfair to the rural feedlot neighbors that have to live by the facilities. I urge you to vote against this bill. Thank you, Mr. Ayers. Patrick Hines and then Stephen Carpenter. Again, folks, if you could please limit your, your testimony. Um, we're, we've got two more bills to hear after this one. Yes, you can, you can, yeah. If you're splitting your time, you each get a minute. <laughs> They only had one person on the list. Go ahead, Mr. Hines. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Patrick Hines. I'm with the League of Minnesota Cities. Um, the League is concerned with the impact that this bill would have on the ability of local units of government to bring uh, public nuisance claims. Um, as you know, nuisance claims are generally disputes between private property owners, both of whom want the full use and enjoyment of their property. And oftentimes, it's a local unit of government who is um, the first entity that's going to deal with these type of disputes. And while public nuisance claims aren't common, um, they are an important tool if uh, a local unit of government um, can't see an issue resolved any other way. Um, that's why, in, in our opinion, that the public nuisance, um, the ability to bring a public nuisance claim was originally exempted from many of the provisions of the underlying law. And um, we don't see that there's a need to change the underlying law today. Um, regarding the DE3 amendment, um, the new language in subdivision 2B directly conflicts with the language in subdivision 2 of the existing law. So you're creating a conflict that either makes the existing law a nullity or at the very least creates ambiguity and litigation over whether an agricultural operation um, is not a public nuisance uh, under the new language or if there's a rebuttable presumption um, that it has to meet if it is under the old language. Um, so we think that conflict uh, creates a lot of problems. But also note that in the existing law, it says after two years an agricultural operation is not a nuisance if it meets certain standards. That law does not apply to swine facilities over 1,000 animal units, and it doesn't apply to cattle operations over 2,500 animal units. The new language in subdivision 2B does not have that exception, so it would be a change from um, the current policy that the state has adopted. And finally, I would note that 
on lines 2.27 to 2.30, that's new subdivision 2BA, that language is not tied to any of the PCA standards that are referenced uh, later in the bill. So it is a much more general statement about what can and cannot be a nuisance. And it uses the phrase, no measurable adverse impact, which I don't believe is defined elsewhere in statute and uh, is a very broad uh, language. It would be very difficult to meet that standard in our opinion. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hines. Please state your name for the record and go ahead with your testimony. Madam Chair, members of the committee, I'm Ken Sulem with the Minnesota Association of Townships. And uh, we are in agreement with Mr. Hines. Our reading of the uh, DE3 would render current law our two-year window of, of saying that there is a problem, even if they're meeting standards, there's still a, a public nuisance problem, renders that section of law meaningless uh, because you're having a section that out says it shall not be, period. No, no exceptions, no waivers, no look back. It just is not a suit that can be brought uh, under the uh, new sections of 2B. And so it, it renders the current law completely meaningless for any practical enforcement. And it is a great expansion by the fact that it now applies to any form of animal agriculture uh, versus just operations under 1,000. So with those two things, um, we look forward to working with Representative Anderson. Uh, I worked with him after his, his committee hearing uh, a week ago, and we're hoping to find a solution to bring back that look back period, uh, but it does not exist in the current bill. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Uh, Stephen Carpenter and Bobby King is on deck. <coughs> Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record, and if you could keep your testimony to two minutes, that would be very helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Stephen Carpenter. I am an attorney at Farmers Legal Action Group, a nonprofit law firm here in Minnesota that has worked on behalf of family farmers for decades. I've worked at, at FLAG uh, since 1993, and I guess uh, I might as well just go ahead and say I grew up on a dairy farm too, so I don't really hate agriculture in general, but I've got some, we have some concerns about this bill. I'd like to focus my testimony on what I think are the four most important ways in which this bill changes the current statute, and I'd like to talk just briefly about the possibility that the bill itself is unconstitutional. The bill changes the way the Minnesota's right to farm law works. The four most important ways that it changes them, um, part, of, part of them have been mentioned. Number one is that it essentially gives a livestock operation a free pass if it follows the official regulations and rules that the state provides. Um, one of the things that assumes, therefore, is that the agencies that regulate these operations have an adequate budget, operate quickly, and essentially make no mistakes. Because at present, if any of those things go wrong, the, the neighbors still have the option to file a nuisance lawsuit. This law, this bill assumes that those entities never make mistakes, essentially. I would note as well that the the, the effect of following the regulations doesn't cut both ways. That is to say, the bill provides significant <laughs> opportunities for operations not to follow the statute, but still gain immunity under the, under the bill. So in other words, if they do meet all the regulations, they're immune, but if they don't, they might be immune still. The second biggest change that I know, would note is, was briefly alluded to previously, is the measurable adverse impact standard. You'll notice that under the bill, no one can be sued for nuisance unless they can show there is a measurable adverse impact. That, of course, is not defined in the bill. And what that means is that uh, if, even if an operation did not follow the relevant rules and regulations applicable, if the plaintiffs couldn't prove a measurable adverse impact, the operation is immune from a nuisance lawsuit. So even if they don't follow the rules, they still get protected. The third biggest thing that we would argue changes with this bill is the reduction of local control. You just heard people, uh, people testify that both public nuisance and planning and zoning powers are reduced for the localities. Um, that completely eliminated it, uh, those rights which exist at present and which are protected under the current statute. The fourth biggest change that occurs in the bill would be that you create additional important loopholes for odor. The entire regulation as it exists now hinge, takes odor and defines it as hydrogen sulfide. That's the only way the odor gets regulated 
according to the bill and according to the, the, in the way that w people would be protected from nuisance lawsuits. Unfortunately, as scientists have noted, hydrogen sulfide is not the sole source of order. There's a National Academy of Sciences study that sh argues that there are 330 compounds in hog manure that cause odor. In other words, if you were able to meet the hydrogen sulfide state requirements, your farm could not be sued for nuisance, even if all of the other additives and chemical elements that caused the odor were present in high quantities, created an immense nuisance, you still couldn't be sued. Those, uh, Madam Chair, are the four most important ways that, that it seems that the statute changes current law. The current law protects the vast majority of farms in Minnesota from nuisance lawsuits to a quite significant degree. This bill would give them essentially a free pass and apply to even the largest operations. My final point would be that there is a constitutional question regarding the bill. The state of Iowa passed, as, as all 50 states have done, a form of a right to farm law. The, state, the Iowa Supreme Court, however, ruled that once you start taking away people's power to file a nuisance lawsuit, what you have done is take away their property rights. Nuisance is your ability to protect your own property from other people interrupting your enjoyment of it. If the state legislature decides that I cannot protect my property in order to make good use of it, the Iowa Supreme Court ruled that when the state legislature does that, they have taken away one of my constitutional rights under the Fifth Amendment to not have my property taken without compensation. No one knows what Minnesota courts would do, um, but and you know you have a very uneven result in courts across the country, but it is an important and open question. Thank you, Madam Chairman. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Carpenter. Um, next up, Bobby King, and then Joel Carlson. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and go ahead with your testimony. Again, try to keep it brief. Uh, Madam Chair, my name is Bobby King. I uh, <clears throat> am with the Land Stewardship Project. Uh, we're a farm and rural organization that works to promote a family farm based system of agriculture. Many of our farmer members raise livestock and we're actively engaged in promoting more livestock on the land. Uh, I want to say first that the overwhelming majority of farmers are covered by the existing law uh, and this bill unnecessarily, unnecessarily broadens that protection uh, to the very largest producers and it's not a matter of uh, uh, just to put it in perspective, uh, a thousand animal units is 2,400 sows. Most hog producers are under that, that limit. So the majority of producers are currently covered by our, our existing law, which is working well. I mean, really, we've only had one case come forward complaining about the law, one hog entity. Um, I don't know of any other industry that asks for this kind of extraordinary weakening, weakening of neighbors' rights to operate. Uh, and I do think most farmers take pride in getting along with their neighbors and, in fact, don't want or need this type of protection. And, and it's just the very few cases where a, pr a proposer insists on pushing forward despite very valid concerns from neighbors when these uh, problems arise. Uh, the one particular about the law I wanted to uh, uh, speak a little bit more to was the hydrogen sulfide issue. Hydrogen sulfide standards are based on health concerns. Hydrogen sulfide uh, at long-term low-level exposures is a health problem. So our standard is based on health concerns. It's, it's very different from odor. Um, and you can be in compliance with the hydrogen sulfide law and really, really be giving up obnoxious odor because you're not using biofilters because you're not using windbreaks, because you're not using pit additives, you're not doing the things that most other operators do uh, to get along with neighbors. Um, so we feel that that in particular is inappropriate. And that in general, this legislation gives the very largest operators the, really the ability to harm neighbors uh, without appropriate accountability. And in fact, that is bad for the livestock industry when you, when you give people that kind of power. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Mr. Carlson and uh, finally John Hottinger will be the final testifier. Good morning, Mr. Carlson. Go ahead and state your name for the record and if you could keep your comments brief, that would be much appreciated. I will, Madam Chair. 
Uh, Madam Chair and members, Joel Carlson. I own a legal research and government affairs business here in St. Paul, and I'm here on behalf of the Minnesota Association for Justice. And our members uh, come to the capital, capital to advocate for the legal, constitutional uh, rights of Minnesotans and their right to trial by jury. And this particular measure uh, goes far afield from where the current law exists. Uh, Madam Chair and members, I think we need to look at what nuisance is. And it's defined in statute 56101. And, and a nuisance is anything that is injurious to your health, indecent or offensive, an obstruction to the free use of your property, and that is to so and to interfere with the comfortable enjoyment of life or property, and that is a nuisance. That's been the law in Minnesota since I believe at least 1905. So for 110 years, we've had a right to bring about a claim to abate a nuisance. It, these aren't damage cases. These, these are people that have to go to court to get an operator to um, essentially comply with community standards. And it hasn't been said, but you need to know that the activity doesn't need to be illegal to be a nuisance. <laughs> Compliance here is not the issue. And quite frankly, as others have said, in, Min in Minnesota, there is no policy on odor. And it, we used to have one. And the PCA repealed it in 1998. And they have no policy right now on odor. And the reason, one of the reasons the PCA testified in the Ag Committee that they eliminated the odor standard is one, it is subjective and it is community based. And number two, we felt c comfortable eliminating that because citizens had the right to bring a nuisance claim when there are problems that need to be addressed. We believe this legislation eliminates that right in a way that is completely unfair for residents because it is based upon issues that you could not ever prove. I would also point out, Madam Chair and members, if you look at the bill, and I appreciate the testimony and agree with the testimony of the League of Cities, the townships, and the others that have presented here, but I want to add one additional point. Throughout the language of this bill, if you look at uh, lines, or the DE3, uh, 2.13, 2.28, 2.29, and throughout the bill, you will notice that they use the term that these facilities will not be considered a nuisance as a matter of law. That's a term of art, members. That means you do not get to talk to a jury. You do not get to talk to a jury of your peers about the nuisance conditions that you're experiencing. This eliminates your right to a trial by jury, a basic constitutional right, and we have serious concerns about it. Uh, Madam Chair and members, happy to answer questions, uh, but this is a serious departure in the law from where we've been, and, and uh, I hope you will seriously uh, consider the consequences of approving this bill. Thank you, Madam Thank Chair you, and Mr. members. Carlson. And this is the happiest St. Patrick's Day I've, uh, I think I've ever had. It's the lonely at this table. We've had awesome witnesses that are uh, on the side of justice this time, and it was, I really appreciate it. It's been great. Thank you, Madam Thank Chair. Thank you. Um, Mr. Hottinger. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name and association uh, and go ahead with your testimony. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members. Now, my name is John Hottinger. I'm here representing the Sierra Club, North Star Chapter, the leading grassroots voice to preserve and protect Minnesota's environment with over 14,000 members. Now, Minnesota's environment needs protection, but so do the people impacted by Minnesota's environment. I have a lengthy piece of testimony that has been done much better by more recent witnesses. So I'm not going to repeat any of them except to uh, uh, give my agreement with witnesses who have appeared before you from the Lake of Cities and the townships, uh, from the Law Center, uh, folks who have actually talked about what this law is. It's always a good idea to be skeptical when a proposed bill is brought to you to try and alter a current court case. Uh, that was one of the most uh, problematic things in this bill, and I thank the author for making sure this is not retroactive. Uh, but it still closes the door to the courthouse for many viable folks who have complaints about nuisance. Now, we all know the major economic impact of agriculture, uh, but we also have to pay, <clears throat> we also have protections for the property rights of people 
and the people rights uh, were impacted negatively by irresponsible circumstances. Uh, there's been a uh, somewhat uh, tentative balance on that issue for 10 to 15 years now. Uh, for allowing one lawsuit to impact us, where, and the witnesses talked about that lawsuit. Now, I don't know anything about that lawsuit. Uh, it is not a good way to approach policy. The defects in the bill from a legal standpoint, uh, most of you can clearly see, I hope, after listening to this testimony. Um, but let me end with one final thing, and that's a reaffirmation of what Mr. Carlson just told you. Uh, this bill takes away from the normal judicial process of resolving viable disputes by eliminating whole ranges of people from any recourse uh, for a damaging neighbor. And uh, I would see, or I wouldn't, the Sierra Club would ask for your consideration and to not pass this <coughs> bill, uh, upsetting the balance of uh, power and uh, the relationships between agriculture and people who live near it. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Hodger. A um, couple of questions from members. Representative Lesh. If there's well, a specific testifier you'd like to hear from, feel free to call them to the table. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just from hearing all the testimony, I, I, uh, I think this bill warrants more than a, a couple questions. Uh, but my question is for the author. Um, Representative Anderson, about half the testifiers we heard from testified specific to these uh, gourly pork producers with whom I'm not familiar. Um, is, this, is this a bill for one business? Or if not, why? I mean, we heard from trade groups, uh, but a lot of the testimony seems to impact a specific lawsuit related to a specific business. Now, um, is this a proxy fight for, I mean, this lawsuit a proxy fight for larger issues in the legal community, um, or, which may very well be the case, um, but why is all of this focusing on one business? Representative Anderson. Thanks, Madam Chair. And Representative, as I understand, there are, there are currently three lawsuits pending in, in Minnesota uh, under this heading of nuisance lawsuits. And I believe the, the Gorley location was one of them. And that's why we, we took out uh, pending cases from our first, uh, first appearance in my Ag Policy Committee. So um, a lot of the testimony was on that particular operation. But uh, being the language has been changed to only <laughs> look ahead, to, to uh, look down the road and not look at pending lawsuits, um, that would, as I understand, wouldn't be affected by, by this bill. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, well, and, and part, of, part of my questions uh, relate to the fact that you got heads of trade groups, you brought your lawyer from your big law firm, you got an accountant in here. Um, and so it causes me to question, it looks to me like kind of a David and Goliath issue. Now, I'm willing to bet on the other side, someone would say, no, these small property owners uh, adjacent to these farms are, are funded by some big groups or something. I bet you that's what I'd hear, but I, I haven't heard a lot about that today. Um, regardless, um, let me ask another question, uh, Representative Anderson. If, I'm, if I buy a house uh, next to one of these farms, um, and I have a situation like Ms. Goodwin testified to where my, my sons are suffering respiratory issues, um, <laughs> And your bill says that you have to have some measurable impact. Okay, um, is my kids hacking and having respiratory issues, is that enough measurable impact for you under the terms of this, this bill? Representative Anderson. Madam Chair and Representative, uh, if there were some valid medical claim, uh, I would assume uh, yes, but uh, it would have to be a, a, a doctor's uh, decision or whatever that, that that would be possible but again if I, if I could just add a lot of the testimony about that site and, and, and other possibilities has to do with siting and to me siting is a is a local issue a planning and zoning county board issue and those things should be addressed in the permitting process uh, in terms of location next to a house that you or anybody else may may own 
And that's a local issue that I think uh, would be addressed, should be addressed uh, in, in the permitting process. Well, Madam Chair, I think, I think local authorities do try to address this stuff in the permitting process. But let me tell you, my first po political job was in 1999, and I worked for a Ward 2 city council member. And a lot of folks had some good ideas uh, to get together. They thought it would be a great idea to stick an ethanol plant in the middle of an urban area. And uh, you, for anyone's purposes, they thought it was a good idea. And uh, Gopher State Ethanol opened up at the old Sch Schmidt Brewery down there on West 7th Street. And it was great because, you know, jobs came in and we were going to get an industry going that had, that had been shuttered, really. Um, well, I happened to be the legislative aide for the Ward 2 Council member the day that thing opened. And my phone rang nonstop for months. And all the permitting processes had been hit. All the I's had been dotted and all the T's had been crossed. But that didn't let up the people down there from organizing. And they were told they met all the standards. The PCA signed off on it. Everything's good. These people started going down to Bloomington to the owner's house and sabotaging his cars and his house because they had no recourse. And I wonder if that's what we're saying, if we're saying you don't have access to the courts. If your kids are hacking at night, a week after this thing opens next to you, what kind of option are we giving them if we don't give them an option to a jury? Madam Chair, you know, I know that we're, we went long on this bill, and you don't have a lot of time. Uh, but I have a lot more questions um, about what exactly this is doing, about how it's tied to either a specific business or specific <laughs> industry. I don't know why uh, ag should receive this benefit. Why shouldn't we give it to uh, the, the ethanol producers down on West 7th? to force them to show measurable impacts, which was hard for these people to do down on West 7th. Um, or for example, when I was a kid driving down to South St. Paul, and the wind came in from the east on occasion, and the stench from those rendering plants floated up from the river uh, that provided jobs for the town of South St. Paul. Um, and my dad always laughed and said, ah, the smell clears the sinuses, and we'd all be rolling up our windows. It's horrible. Um, now the people in South St. Paul, those, those had been there for 100 years. Um, so they got used to it, and no one who moved in there uh, moved in there, and then all of a sudden a rendering plant opened. Um, but it seems to me that you're allowing ham producers uh, to be ham-fisted in how they run their operations if they don't have to be subject to the same kind of accountability for their mistakes as any other industry does. So, Madam Chair, um, I have a lot more questions but I suspect we don't have time for it in committee. I, I hope to God there can be some fix for this. After. Where is this going from here, Madam Chair? Uh, Representative Lesh, this is going to Environment and Natural Resources. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Representative Schoen. Um, Madam Chair and Representative Anderson, how, so I, when I think about this particular bill, I think about my community and 3M is down there. And you know, decades ago, we, uh, uh, our city council at the time, long, long before I was probably born, um, said, hey, it's okay to have this incinerator here. So they truck in all the hazardous waste from all their plants all over the country. And, and uh, basically they got uh, carte blanche to do this forever because of the agreement. And so how does this affect the future? And so if the MPCA says, well, we need lower limits, we've uh, learned that this actually is, causes more health hazards than it doesn't. Does the producer have to agree by that or do they have to um, are they grandfathered for the for the future? Representative Anderson. Thanks, Madam Chair. Representative Schoen. <clears throat> uh, this bill doesn't address the standards in terms of, of where they are. And if we need tougher standards, if we need to have a, a, a smell test for ammonia, for example, let's do that. But currently there isn't. So I think you have to understand the, the, the predicament a producer is in if they if they fulfill all of the current uh, requirements and yet then are, are subject to a, to a nuisance lawsuit. But, but to a short answer, if the standards change, then the producer must meet those new standards. This bill does not, not uh, grandfather anybody in. It, it just says follow the standards that are in place, whatever they may be, and um, if you do that, you would not be subject to a nuisance lawsuit. Representative Sean. Madam Chair and Representative Anderson, so um, and that's a uh, thank you for that answer. I guess what other what other industry do we do this for? 
And when I say industry, I mean how, how, that this is particularly carved out in this way. I mean, I grew up a farm kid out in Murdoch, Minnesota, and we had, you know, every now and then we'd have 20, 30 uh, hogs in the barn or something. And that, that was family farm. I mean, this is, this is industry. This is, not, this is not the same as, as the family farm. Now, I, I would say that, you know, you do need to be bigger because you feed more families uh, in, in that manner. But, you know, when it's, uh, when you're talking in one county, 100,000 head, or, I mean, I've got family friends that milk 5,000 head of dairy cattle. I mean, but that's not a family farm. And so when even when you look at other issues where people are concerned long term, about uh, you know aquifers and and water related issues and and they know that twice a year when the lagoons are emptied out and they're you know within six miles of the plant they can uh, knife in uh, the uh, the the secretions from the lagoon for fertilizer but long term does this alleviate and protect them? from long-term actions if there was damage to the aquifer or any other environmental damages? And does this alleviate that? Representative Anderson. Madam Chair and Representative Schoen, I, I don't think so. Uh, we have never gotten into the discussion of, of uh, handling the, the manure waste in terms of this bill, uh, except in the area of smell. And currently in statute, there's a 21-day window when they can spread their manure and uh, it's going to smell, you know, live, livestock smell. And to answer your first question, uh, what other industries have this? Since 1982, small operations have had this protection in Minnesota. In 1982, that's what, what 30 some years ago or whatever, the livestock was different. And as you mentioned, Representative, livestock has changed, operations <laughs> have gotten bigger. And, and I would suggest that the larger operations are the ones that have you know, staff on hand to, to do the EAWs, uh, any uh, NPDES permitting that has to be done. Uh, for the most part, uh, they have the ability to do things right and um, for the most part do a good job because they have the size and scope to be able to do that. So with the changing climate and agriculture, uh, we feel that uh, Adding this provision to larger operations is, is something that, uh, that we should do here, that, that I feel we should do in Minnesota. Representative Schoen. What is, uh, would Mr. Carlson come down for a quick question? I'm curious, just to, I just want to hear for sure that anything in this particular uh, potential legislation doesn't change any other uh, area of statute for liability or otherwise and that it is, in your opinion, strictly uh, about air quality and odor, Mr. and that's Carlson. it. Uh, Mr. Chairman and uh, members, I'm going to give a, a qualified uh, answer to that, uh, Representative Schoen, because uh, um, we don't know what um, is the meaning of measurable adverse effects. So they're never a nuisance on anything if you don't have a measurable adverse effect, and that's not defined. I'll say our most significant problem with the bill is related to uh, odors and runoff um, that uh, maybe don't, that are nuisance conditions, but maybe don't have long-term environmental impacts. Um, but we don't know what that term means, and so I'm going to give you a qualified answer. I can't say definitively it only relates to odor because I just don't know what that standard means. And when you look at the bill on, um, um, I'm, I'm looking for it right now, I think it's 2.27. Um, it cannot be a nuisance if it has no measurable adverse impact related to the alleged nuisance. I don't know what that term means, and so I can't give you a definitive answer. Representative Pinto. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm Representative Anderson. I guess I'm, I'm thinking about the concept of nuisance. It's a couple hundred years old in our legal system, right? And it, and it um, it's an embodiment of the, I'm thinking about the principle with uh, these uh, farms and then the nearby homeowners, uh, the basic principle that, you know, your right to swing your fist stops when you hit my nose. And it feels like this is a real threat to private property rights. It feels like we're, we're uh, you've got two different groups here 
and uh, and the right of the farm, the this industrial, this agricultural operation, to do its activities. That that right needs to be limited in some way when that when that fist hits the the homeowner in the nose, so to speak. And so it seems like why would we take away this uh, legal principle we've had for a couple hundred years for these operations and favor the property rights of the Goliath over the private property rights of the David, the homeowner who's living nearby? Representative Anderson. Madam Chair, quickly, again, I, I would say that those things should be addressed up front in the permitting process. And, and again, if we have a, a subjective or objective standard, how do you measure it? Is it just a smell test, which may be different for me or for you? Uh, there, there's just a need to get some certainty into what uh, would actually be a nuisance. Representative Pinto. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I'll just point out we've got like 400 years of jurisprudence, you know, that, that that is built up for that. That says that there are certain things that, for homeowners, we got a whole we got a whole system built up to do that. So I don't know why we would um, favor the rights of the one group over the other, based on state standards that I gather. I've been looking all over this. Really, don't are not designed for this particular situation. Designed for some purposes, but at some point, you know, traditionally in our legal system, homeowners uh, and others have a right to enforce their uh, private property rights through this system. So thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, we are running out of time. We have um, a couple bills left, both of which have out-of-state testifiers. And so what I'd like to do is um, renew my motion to uh, uh, pass or re-recommend re uh, House File 582 as amended to be re-referred to the uh, Committee on Environment and Natural Resources. All those Madam in favor, Chair, please I ask for roll call. A roll call has been requested. The clerk will take the roll. Chair Scott. Aye. Representative Smith. Aye. Representative Applebaum. No. Representative Grunhagen. Aye. Representative Hillstrom. Representative Hoppy. Aye. Representative Johnson. Representative Lush. Nay. Representative Lomer. Aye. Representative Pinto. No. Representative Schoen. Representative Vogel. Aye. Representative Zeros. Six to four, the motion passes. Thank you, Representative Anderson. You're on your way to Environment and Natural Resources. Um, Representative Sanders, we're going to hear your bill first. If you could have your out of town testifier come first, that would be very helpful. I would like to move House File 864 that it uh, be re referred to the Committee on Transportation. Go ahead, Representative uh, Sanders. Thank you, Madam Chair and members uh, for hearing this important bill. Uh, House File 864 um, is an anti-fraud, uh, anti-insurance fraud bill uh, spe specifically dealing with uh, insurance fraud. Um, I don't know if you know this or not, but Minnesota actually ranks in the top five for insurance, uh, auto insurance fraud. And a lot of that has to do with our no-fault system, which is a great system, very consumer-oriented, um, but also opens the door for a lot of fraud. Uh, there are three major sections to this bill, all of which have been implemented in other states and are working successfully um, in those states to curb fraud. This is not a bill that will eliminate fraud in Minnesota, but it will give us the tools uh, to hopefully slow down uh, fraud and to uh, protect our consumers. Uh, I have a couple guests, a um, couple testifiers with me today, and I'd like to uh, start by turning it over to them and uh, let them proceed, Madam Chair. Um, Ms. Uh, Representative Sanders, before we get started, do you have an A3 or is that somebody else's? Um, Madam Chair, that is my amendment and if it's okay, I'd like to uh, have my testifier go first and we'll explain the amendment because uh, it um, is kind of a compromise um, situation so I think it would unfold sure. a little easier for the committee. Very good. Is that good? Go ahead. Okay. Thank you for being here. Go ahead and stay Good morning, Madam Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Tim Lynch. I'm the Director of Governmental Affairs at the Des Plaines, Illinois slash Chicago-based uh, National Insurance Crime Bureau. Uh, the NICB is a national not-for-profit organization uh, that works with our member companies and law enforcement to investigate major cases of insurance fraud, uh, namely organized crime. Uh, we are active in all 50 states and we employ two agents right here in Minnesota. Uh, in short, uh, we strongly support this measure. Uh, the enactment of these anti-fraud remedies along with the effective work of law enforcement, will have a positive impact on the anti-fraud environment of Minnesota and cut back on insurance fraud. 
Uh, from the NICB standpoint, we are the questionable claim repository for about 95% of the property casualty industry. So as we know, insurance companies file claims. A certain amount of those claims are deemed questionable, which means they are suspicious. They might, they might be insurance fraud. And we are seeing some major problems here in Minnesota with respect to medical, medical fraud schemes. What does that mean? Specifically, we are seeing the, involving, the involvement of staged automobile accidents and collusion among healthcare providers, attorneys, and runners hired to funnel unsuspecting claimants, which leads to a conveyor belt of abuse in the medical payment schemes. Now, I'll put a disclaimer next to the word medical, medical providers and attorneys. 99% of those folks here in Minnesota are good, hardworking uh, citizens. We are talking about a small percentage of folks committing fraud. But in the words of Anoka County Attorney Tony Palumbo, insurance fraud in sh is, in short, bad people doing bad things to good people. And we are seeing some victimization here of elderly populations, immigrants, and others. In addition, insurance fraud is low risk for a high reward. In fact, the Department of Commerce reported to the Senate Commerce Committee last fall that the economic impact of fraud cases prosecuted in 2014 is north of $55 million. There's four reasons this bill is very important to the NICB. Number one, the rise in those medical fraud schemes that I talked about here ranks, as Tim said, in the top five nationally. And the upticks that we're seeing on, in lines of those frauds uh, have doubled and tripled over the past couple of years. Number two, and this is very problematic, as states such as Florida and New York have made some anti-fraud crackdowns, we are seeing migration to Minnesota from fraudsters that once operated in those states, and still do, but see this as a good state to do business. Thirdly, these are organized criminals. This is their job. This is their profession. And they do not discriminate. They rip off anyone and everyone. And per that, estimates have this crime costing Minnesota taxpayers north of $1,000 annually. Again, as Tim Sanders mentioned, many of these provisions, in fact, all these provisions have been enacted in other states, namely California, Florida, Maryland, Michigan, New York, and Texas, and just last week, Kentucky also enacted a bill very similar to this. Our national nexus tells us these are needed anti-fraud remedies, they're not revolutionary. And your state has been statutory obligated to fight fraud, and you have a terrific fraud unit here. But to do it effectively, they need the right tools in the toolbox. And we see these as needed and vital tools. Uh, this bill is also supported by a group called the Coalition Against Insurance Fraud. Uh, that group is comprised of not only insurance companies, but about every major consumer protection organization in this country. They are also a strong supporter of this bill. I want to make that known for the record. With that, um, I thank you for your time. I thank Representative Sanders for his leadership on this issue. I thank you, Madam Chairman, for your time. Thank you, Mr. Lynch. Um, Representative Sanders, did you want to go over the amendment, or were you wanting the testifier to do that? Uh, I'll have Mr. Franz and help us go through the uh, Very amendment. Good. Welcome to the committee, and please state your name for the record, and go ahead with your testimony. Madam Chair, my name is Doug Franzen. I'm an attorney for NICB, the National Insurance Crime Bureau. And this amendment, the A3, um, would put, is a result of the hearings we had in Commerce and some of the comments that were made there, and I believe this resolves uh, those issues. Um, this amendment has been vetted both with the Minnesota Association for Justice and the Minnesota Chiropractic Association. There's no objection to it. Um, it's technical. Um, essentially, what it does is it articulates um, the hearing process. If a civil penalty is imposed on someone accused of fraud and they want to contest that, the uh, that allegation, they have chapter 14 rights. Those rights are specified and articulated in detail here. 
Uh, that would be lines 1, 5 through 1.4 of the amendment. Um, we also deleted the language um, that's currently on the, the bill 1.12, 1, 1 deleting the Commerce Fraud Bureau as redundant and confusing. And finally, on section 3, there was a provision restricting accident solicitation where in commerce it was a gross misdemeanor. Uh, the language that it be a gross misdemeanor has been removed. Uh, there is no specified penalty. <laughs> Accordingly, it would be treated under the law as a petty misdemeanor, which we thought was probably a more appropriate uh, uh, provision for that solicitation. Uh, those are the provisions of the amendment, and at any point, uh, Madam Chair, if you'd like me to put them in the context of the bill, I could do that, or do you want to move a copy of the amendment? Thank you for your testimony. Um, any discussion on the um, A3 amendment? I would like to move the A3 amendment uh, be adopted. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. The A3 is adopted. Representative Sanders, um, I believe you have, mm, do you have other testifiers on behalf of the bill? No. Madam Chair, we do not have any more testifiers. Um, thank you. Um, then we'll move on with um, uh, former Representative Jim Abler is here to testify. Madam Chair, before we move on, we Mr. have, Branson. I have to explain why we have no other testifiers. Um, I think I did uh, before that this is we've been striving for consensus. Uh, we have reached agreements on this legislation with the Minnesota Chiropractic Association. Uh, Mr. Goodno is here. Um, we are working uh, with the Minnesota Association for Justice. We're not quite there yet, but we're moving in that direction. Um, Mr. Johnson has waived uh, his right to testify in the interest of time uh, of the Insurance Federation, but he did want to me to mention a letter from Ramsey County, John Choi, endorsing this bill, and particularly the provisions relating to the civil penalties imposed by commerce and the deauthorization. Um, by and large, uh, with there is a general agreement on those two. I believe Mr. Abler's client, uh, Mr. Dahl, a chiropractor, does not like one provision. Otherwise, there's um, general agreement on those two pieces. And I think both Mr. Goodno and Mr. Carlson are here available. Thank you, Mr. Franzen. And, and just so you know, we did not get a letter from uh, Mr. Choi. So if, if you have that. Madam Chair, I will submit it. OK, thank you so much. All right. Uh, Mr. Abler. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Jim Abler representing SUMA MRI and here in my own right as well. Uh, I've been involved in a lot of this anti-fraud, no-fault work my entire career here and in my 36 years of practice and also on behalf of my client. Um, this is a hard topic to deal with and it's always at the end of the hearings and it's uh, to do it well to get a bill to pass is not as easy as bringing forward an idea that we all agree with and you know, it's just passing it. There is universal <laughs> agreement that we don't want people coming from out of state to stage accidents and commit $55 million of the fraud. Nobody argues about that. Um, the issue comes about how about the innocent people that get caught up in the net just by accident or from a petty infraction or that fall in the, a foul of some investigator at the Department of Commerce. Those are the people I heard about when I was a legislator that they couldn't get out of the net. They, uh, and, and so some assertion was brought and they could never get done. Uh, bail bondsmen, uh, agents, other kinds of people who run afoul of that. The amendment that went, at, that went on actually took out reference to the Department of Fraud. I came to talk about that with some concerns. Now the bill is silent on who would do the investigation and the commissioner now may uh, issue an order upon uh, finding intent of fraud. It doesn't say who can do it. So you've actually removed a safeguard, just to caution you. And the second concern I have is about the standard of evidence. It's curious the chiropractor comes forward talking about evidentiary standards, but actually if you do this long enough, you realize how important those are. The, the standard in the bill is preponderance, which means they probably did it. That's 51%. And uh, I can't tell how many times as a married man I've needed that 49% <laughs> to explain the rest of why I didn't, why it's not what you thought. 
The standard I recommend to you that's more safe is clear and convincing, which is 75%. That means we're quite sure they did it. Uh, that you can't go to uh, beyond a reasonable doubt that's a conviction in the bill. It, it makes it unworkable. But there are people who uh, have been part of investigations and so on that would have been caught up in that intermediate part between preponderance and clear and convincing. And, and I don't know, uh, I've been trying to work with the, with the uh, uh, organizations on this and they're disinterested, Madam Chair. They think this is a good standard because they want to start cracking down on fraud. And we're all against fraud. But uh, in the same way, we don't have any innocent people getting caught up in this. Uh, that's, just, that's the responsibility of this committee. And so I urge you to think about this. I'm going to continue to work. But I'll tell you, having done all this no-fault work, what happens in these bills is those people that got the votes hunker down and they enjoy the fact they got their votes. Uh, real no-fault reform was evidenced in 2012 when I had the task force, which was the first successful task force that actually had a collegial collaborative approach where people truly came on board and we got some stuff done. Uh, if we move away from where uh, the people are truly in interacting, and there's been some interaction, not to minimize that, you're going to wind up with a bill that may not even get signed. And so you want to really crack down on the fraud, and you want to push the people to behave. But there's fraud on a whole bunch of different parts, Madam Chair and members. There's, a, there's bad actions by a few insurance companies or a few adjusters who go crazy. There's some agents who are wrong. There's some providers who are wrong. But the most of the people are really, really good. And you don't want to draw them up into the net where they could be caught. So those are my concerns. And uh, if they could address that, I would be very happy to be a fan of this bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Abler. Uh, Representative Sanders, any closing remarks? Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, uh, I'll just say, I mean, we, th we think it's a, it's a good bill. Um, a lot of support, a lot of movement on this bill to reach um, agreement. We have uh, support from the Ramsey County attorneys, Washington County, Dakota County, Anoka County attorneys, and would appreciate all the members' support. Thank you, Rep Representative Sanders. And my apologies to Mr. Carlson. He'd given me his name, and it was written on the side here, so my apologies. Go ahead with your testimony. Uh, Madam Chair and members, Joel Carlson for the Association for Justice. And I'll be very brief because I recognize your uh, time frame here. I want to make a record on the A3 A amendment. I've talked with uh, Mr. Franzen about this, and I want to conf confirm this on the record that the allegations from the insurance commissioner that they may make against a provider who they do not license, we're talking about uh, doctors and, um, and, and uh, chiropractors that are licensed by some other board. I don't want to get into a situation where they're making an allegation that becomes public that may be unfounded. Mr. Franzen informs me that under the Data Practices Act that those allegations are private until there is a final order, and I want to confirm that on the record. Uh, as to the bill itself, Madam Chair and members, we, we obviously are opposed to fraud in any of its form, whether it's from an insurance company, an attorney, a staged accident. Um, we think the bill has some problems as it relates to people being able to get their uh, uh, needed information about their legal rights, but we've been willing to work with the industry to advance this bill. We wouldn't ask you to vote no on it today. However, if it was a final package, I would maybe have a different response. It's a work in progress, and uh, we wouldn't ask you to hold it here. Thank you, Mr. Carlson. Uh, I understand now I've been told that um, this will not be going to transportation, it'll be going to public safety. So with that, um, I would renew my motion that House File 864 as amended be re-referred to the Committee on Public Safety. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. The bill is on its way to public safety. Thank you, Representative Sanders. We are in recess. When we return tonight, we will hear um, uh, Representative Whalen's bill and pick up with our agenda there. Thank you, folks.